Long week so far? We'll see. Let's, we're going to talk about heat capacity. Um, heat capacity is a nice fundamental measurement. Um, unfortunately, the theorists all like it and the experimentalists don't because it's not that easy. Um, why heat capacity? Um, it's so much easier to stick two wires on something and measure resistance. Uh, but it is a fundamental quality. It's related to the density of states uh, times the probability factor of occupying the states and the integral over the energy. So you actually know the, the capacity is the ability for that energy to go equally, equally partition theorem into all those density of states that can be occupied and only raise the temperature inversely proportional or proportional to that density of states. So it gives the theorists something they can calculate, something you can measure. Um, it's an extrinsic quantity um, or it's a bulk quantity in that it doesn't get, uh, if you measure transport, you always had the problem of you have an imperfection on the surface, are you getting surface conductivity? This is really measuring like magnetization and we're going to talk about magnetization a little bit here and its relationship to heat capacity of a bulk quantity of really what's going in on in your material. Um, in metals, um, it's really the electrons absorbed, the, the electronic states and the lattice states, the phonons, the vibration, quantum vibrations of the uh, lattice itself. They have different temperature dependence in a very, very simple model of what your material is. One has a nice linear, one has a cubic temperature dependence. Most of what we do here, because we're looking at states that are very fragile, get destroyed at high temperature, states that where we can bring the thermal energy down below the magnetic energy, we're working at low temperatures. And low temperatures is usually below one degree and as low as we can get it. Um, at that point, the, um, this, term becomes very, very small if I, and I am left with just the linear term. So I look at the C over T, sometimes called gamma. It's that, that coefficient there is very, very important. Um, we can ignore that phonon. Simple metals, that gamma goes to about one. For a class of materials that we spend a lot of time here with, which is when you get beyond simple, you get to correlations between the electrons. You get charge density waves, you get all sorts of interaction, and that gamma becomes much, much larger than one, really significantly larger. We call these heavy fermion systems because it seems like they have excess mass, um, but it really is that, that gamma coefficient. The other thing that heat capacity can do is work with many spin systems that you can't do transport on. These are insulators. Um, they have small changes in the spin, which um, Arneel just uh, talked about. You can measure spin very easily with NMR. You also can see changes in their heat capacity. Um, you can identify orders of transitions as you move between different states. This is a complex phase diagram going from one degree down and up to high fields, looking at this compound, which is a frustrated spin system. So it's a triangular lattice of spins. Every spin wants to be opposite its neighbors, and when you have two neighbors, you can't disagree with both of them. As much as you would like to disagree with both of them, um, it's we think of it as a curmudgeon material. Everybody wants to disagree, but if you've got two people already disagreeing, the third one just doesn't know what to do and is somewhat frustrated. Um, some of these transitions, we can see uh, the order of a first order transition. Some of the weaker ones become obviously second order. The heat capacity can show all this where we had, uh, could not see this using many other techniques we tried. It's an insulator, so there's no, um, uh, there's no transport, conductivity, uh, electrical conductivity. Magnetization gave very mixed results on this. And um, what was the other technique? Oh, thermal expansion dilatometry. 
uh, basically showed almost nothing. So I'm going to go over. I've sort of given the introduction. I'm going to talk now about some measurement techniques. Uh, feel free to interrupt uh, and ask questions as we go. Uh, I don't mind. I always maybe figure I've missed something and I should have gone over. Some of the cryogenics and thermometry and other, ins other issues. So you put in heat, you measure the temperature rise. So we put in a pulse of heat. So we put some heat input here and the power goes up. Temperature rises, it's a new temperature, we just keep doing this, the thing warms up slowly, we measure each of those steps, we're done. Go home. Very short talk. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, it's just delta Q over delta T, the limit is you made those small steps and you'd step yourself up. Unfortunately, we're in the real world, as we keep telling you all week, and we, we've mentioned it over and over and over. And the trick is, is you've got to put heat into the sample. Um, so you're going to need wires. Well, now you've got a connection to the outside world. So now you've got extra thermal conductivity away from the sample or into the sample. You've got a thermometer, which is usually for us another resistor. Well, there's four more wires coming into the sample, more thermal conductivity. You've got the thermal uh, heat capacity of the uh, the thermometer and the uh, heater themselves, they're not infinitely small, unfortunately. So you have the sample itself. You have the time it takes for heat to go into the sample. These now are at low temperature. If they're not a metal, they become very poor uh, thermal conductors. So you have another time constant that was in there that I sort of neglected and said, oh, the whole sample just heats uniformly. Um, heat leak to the outside world, uh, you can't isolate it perfectly and then once you attach wires you certainly can't. So we can't do it, attach it psychically as we sometimes wish we could. Um, temperature control, we want to hold the outside world fixed temperature uh, around it so that its conduction to that outside world is fixed. Well that's really hard when you're changing the field and your helium levels are changing and everything else and pumping speed. So temperature control becomes an issue. Measurement, and I've talked about the addenda, the heat and the thermometer, and you've got to measure the heat pulse itself because your heater changes its resistance slightly in field and temperature. So you have to do another four wire measurement of that, of knowing exactly how much heat you've got and hopefully it all goes into the sample. Um, some people heat with, uh, Light pulses, LEDs, you put a little LED down there, light pulse, don't have leads, but you don't really know exactly how much heat is absorbed by the material and how much is reflected. So you end up painting it black. Well, you've now added some extra material down there and you're actually measuring the heat capacity of your sample and the black carbon you've put on the outside. So almost every technique has a drawback and something that complicates the whole issue. <coughs> this is the simplified setup of that ideal sample. Um, and so I have a thermometer here. It's coupled to the sample. Um, somehow I have to attach that, that thermometer. If I'm using a resistance thermometer, I can use a little bit of grease, a little bit of nail polish, silver paint, depending on the material I'm using, the um, uh, the best thermal contact, the sample compatibility. Some you put silver paint on, you'll dissolve a sample. Some so you use nail polish or something mm, that you can use very, very little, make a thin layer. You want to reduce that because you want your thermometer to be <coughs> as uh, close to the sample temperature as possible. But it's never perfect and you will see those effects. The thermometer, you want this box which roughly think of as the heat capacity of that thermometer, to be as small as possible. We use little chips, resistance chips. Um, they're fairly cheap. They're uh, ruthenium oxide chips. And they have a nice temperature dependence and we can measure temperatures by measuring the change in resistance. But the ruthenium oxide's on a big chunk of alumina. And by big chunk, I mean something that's maybe a half millimeter by a millimeter and maybe 100 microns or 150 microns thick. So it's not 
big in how we normally think of things, but it can be compared to my sample. So there's the first thing you grab a graduate student and say, hey, make this uh, thermometer thinner. We don't need all that alumina, a couple of hundred microns of alumina on the back of it. Grind it down and make it as thin as possible. And after they've made them too thin and broken a half dozen, they get them down to where you can actually see the metal film resistor on the other side through the alumina without breaking it. Then you've got just the perfect one. So it's basically go just before breaking the thing. And that's a lot of instructions we give in physics. Go to just before you break it and then stop, which you don't know until you break a bunch of them. So the same with the heater. Heaters we tend to use, again, a chip resistor, but we pick one of a different material that doesn't change with field and temperature. Uh, we pick nichrome usually, it's pretty good. These, as I said, are ruthenium oxides that have a temperature dependent. And again, we have some sort of attachment, nail polish, glue, silver paint, or whatever we can do to give the lowest heat capacity. Even that material has a heat capacity that ends it. So the whole thing is a lot of trade-offs on picking materials and the geometry, trying to make these as small as possible, and adjusting your link then between this thermometer, heater, sample, and a sample holder, which you can then regulate. This is the thing you can now regulate. It also has a heater and a thermometer, which has to at least be able to hold the temperature of this at some given temperature. And then you have the whole bath around the whole thing. It's sitting in liquid helium in a dilution refrigerator, in one of those helium-3 refrigerators, keeping the whole thing cold. And you can allow the heat, this to float above that at some amount. So this will warm up. This whole thing is in a vacuum shield. And you can stick the whole thing as a single unit down somewhere. Um, but you have to make sure that this link isn't too strong, because otherwise you have to put in huge amounts of heat. Then you've got heat flow and gradients and everything else, and you don't want that. So you want this, this link to be something good, which takes a lot of exploring of materials and what you, you and uh, how to design this whole thing of making these time constants for heat flow be something in the, yeah. That's because that's what you buy. Dale, Dale sells these as resistor chips. Okay. So Dale makes them, or I guess they're now Viché who bought Dale. But they're, they're basically, and you, we bought, I bought 5,000 of them uh, from Mouser Electronics for three cents a piece. Okay. So they're cheap. I can use a lot of them. They're tiny. And, um, and there's a picture of one. So this is one of these little chips that's been thinned down. It has solder pads on the end. This is the, I think that is the thermometer on top. This black thing here is the uh, sample itself. That's the crystal and I think it's a barium antimonide crystal, if I remember this experiment. And these are the wires. These are the weak links to the sample holder. So this is the sample out here with the thermometer. On the bottom of it, there's a heater. There's a little bit of silver paint holding these on this sample, which isn't conducting. Um, but this is the resistor surface itself. Underneath it is the alumina that's been thinned down to make it as tight a package as possible. So this, the thermal conductivity of my weak link is along these wires to this platform, which is then my regulated uh, temperature. And so there's two more leads down here for the heater that's on the back side of the sample. And you see just a little bit of it poking out the edge of the sample. So this is a heater thermo sample thermometer sandwich, sort of is the way to think about it. All my thermal conductivity are these leads. These are phosphor bronze leads. Um, I use phosphor bronze because it doesn't change its, uh, its thermal conductivity or electrical conductivity in field 
much. Copper will. So if you use copper, you'd probably also have too strong a leak. And so as you heated this, the heat would immediately flow into your regulated platform and have a very short time constant. So again, it's that trade-off of materials and making. Now the kicker is, is that that whole sample is about a millimeter and a half from top to bottom. So this is about, I believe this is a two millimeter hole in these uh, little chips uh, carriers. So these are commercial chip carriers that we bought and then drilled holes in them with a little diamond drill. So you end up working under a microscope a lot. So what are some of the ways you can then measure? Now that I've got a connection to the outside world, when I add my heat pulse, the heat's going to gradually dissipate and go back down to the base temperature, the temperature of that sample hole or platform, post, whatever we call it. Every, every person doing heat capacity has a different term for it. I think of it as a platform because it was big and round in the first one I made. But you put in the heat, you turn on your heater, it goes up and down, the sample warms up, it comes into some equilibrium where the temperature delta T is enough that the thermal conductivity is allowing the power level to be the same as the power you're putting in. So delta T is going to be proportional to that power level and this um, thermal conductivity to the sample holder. And via decaying function, uh, 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 depending on your heat capacity over time. So this delta T grows as time goes on, that function goes to one, but there is a whole slew of thermal constants. Some are internal to the material as the heat diffuses into your sample, diffuses through the thermometer casing holder, um, the heat capacity of the holders, all those extra things. So you've got really a whole slew of them. The trick in this experiment is to design it that all of those are small except for this one to the sample holder. You want that to be the dominant time constant. You heat it up, you cool it down, um, your heat capacity is proportional to uh, that time constant and that thermal conductivity K to the sample holder, kappa to the sample holder. So if that's the dominant one, you're done. And that's going to be fairly constant. Um, it may have a temperature dependence, which you can calculate. They're usually a power law temperature con uh, dependence. And you can get CP, your heat capacity, straight from this time uh, dependence of these exponential rise and decays, which means you have to digitize the whole thing and fit it. And you always get little blips as it starts and stuff because it's hot, and you've got to fit them out the real world gets you again. It's also the delta T is, um, uh, gives you that kappa as well. So from that delta T, you can continually monitor kappa. So it's all the data is there. Um, it's something that is a little hard to do if you're trying to do this while continuously sweeping field because you have a certain rise time, decay time, and the field is changing during that time. These can be fairly long if you don't design it right. If they become very short, you have to digitize very fast and you end up noisy. So there's a trade-off in how well you can do this. The other way is to not heat it all the way up till it goes flat. Don't do the whole exponential. We think of it as a heat pulse. So you put in a pulse. So now the pulse, the heat pulse, is very short compared to my measurement time. Um, we have uh, one group that comes here does this uh, quite a lot, where they'll put in a heat pulse, measure this at low temperatures, where my thermal conductivities become very low. This can be many seconds to a minute or something. So you're measuring a very long time constant because you have to get all those time constants out of that, but it does decay back. You can get your heat capacity out of it, um, and then you can measure that exponential decay in here was a function of time because that goes off, and you can fit it and extrapolate back and get the uh, 
the peak, and it all looks more or less good. Um, it, it works. Um, it's done a lot. Uh, it's just another way, depending on your time constants, how you set up the, the thing, and your addenda. Dual slope. This is a very cute technique. This is this is this is neat. Now, this is an example is showing only a heating of one percent up and down. But if you look at each point here, take the slope on the up slope, the slope on the down slope. Even though your thermal conductivity may be changing, your thermal connection to the bath may be changing. If they're the same at that temperature, um, then the the heat capacity only depends on your heating power and cooling power, which you um, can be the same because, well, it depends on the heating power and it depends on those slopes and the difference in those two slopes. This can be done over, I'll get, I'll get to a sec, over long. This can be done many, many degrees. If you can hold your platform very, very stable, you need that block heat, that block platform, whatever we kind of call it, to be very stable so that you have the same conditions as you heat and cool. This could be done over large range. You'd have to grab that uh, slope at each point as you go up and down through the same temperature. Oh, I'm sorry. The green is the heat pulse you put in. So you turn on the heater. The sample starts heating way, way up. You turn it off. The sample starts cooling down in blue. So the blue is the cooling portion of the cycle. Uh, red is the heating portion. But you could do this over a five degree range even. And many people do you know, their whole sweep up, you know, 10 minutes of sweeping up in temperature, turn off their heater, let it sweep down in temperature. So you're taking part of that same exponential rise in decay, but you're never getting to the saturation temperature. So you do this when you have a very weak link to the bath so that you don't saturate. And you can heat and cool. The other problem is, is that you, well, you need the warming and the cooling. And you're taking a derivative of real data. And real data has noise. Derivatives of data have noise multiplied by omega, by the, amp, the frequency of the noise. So you'll get high frequency noise taking day, nice theoretical curves. You can take their derivatives like this because this is fake data, and it looks like this, and it was for a demonstration. But if you take derivatives of real data, it gets very noisy. It's one of the problems with this technique. Uh, the no, but it's the, the power is the difference between the cooling power and the heating power, which should be the same. So it, you, you end up with the same time constants there. So the rate is not going to be the same because of the heat capacity. Because if they were the same, you'd have an infinite heat capacity. And they're not quite the same. But um, this will give you, this is the heating power. So if you put in the heating power and use the cooling power as zero here, this is that difference between heating and cooling power. No, well, that just through the link to the bath. See, it's it's really taking this part and that part, which are the same time constant, but the difference in those in the slopes between here and there is so you is the uh, heat capacity or inverse the heat capacity. So you're really taking slices here and not getting up to here where the slope is zero and very large because this, this part. So it's, you're in this part of the diagram. So you need a very long time constant because you never want to get to saturation. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, you assume the external effects are you're, are canceling, you're assuming your connection to the outside world isn't changing drastically and isn't dependent on the, uh, uh, the dur during the heating and pulse cooling time. So there is a stability question as we go over time. 
Now we get to one of the ones I'm going to spend a little more time on, AC calorimetry. In this case, it's a fast continuous measurement. It works well with tiny samples. Um, I showed you my setup with the tiny millimeter sized samples. Um, usually milligram or less, but if you talk to the crystal growers, growing a milligram of crystals is usually about what they're good at. So um, it works pretty well. You can sweep field and temperature because it's a continuous readout technique. Um, it is very hard to get an absolute accuracy because of several geometric factors and time constants that you don't know. But you can get a good relative change in heat capacity out of the uh, material, which helps you identify phase transitions, types of phase transitions, et cetera. And you do, unfortunately, need good thermometry, which you really need for all of these techniques. And it's really the, the big bugaboo, difficult part of uh, uh, measuring heat capacity. So what is it? Um, so again, you're back at this. You want this RSH, this res thermal resistance or the thermal conductivity, to be a fairly quick time constant. Because <coughs> you're going to be making an AC measurement, you want to be able to heat this, have it recover very quickly. So as you put the heat in, you want this time constant to be small. You drive the heater, this heater, with an AC signal. Um, usually a sine wave. There are various techniques to drive it. And there's supposedly some advantage to a triangle wave in one paper. I never quite got convinced. And we tend to use sine waves. But um, I need to go back. Some people use square waves because it's easier. Um, but you drive this uh, with a voltage right out of that lock-in, that reference out, or with an external AC source. And you put that voltage across here, and you get the power V squared over R in here. But it's V squared, so the response, this heater, is going to be heating it at omega. So you're driving it at half omega. So omega is actually the uh, frequency of the heater itself the power. And there's an offset, because you'll be putting in a DC component of heat, too. So the sample will, will be at some DC temperature above the sample holder, as well as having an AC ripple. That all makes sense? OK. So I'm driving this. I'm heating this up with some thermal delays and everything else here. Um, and I measure the, the response of the sample heater, or the sample thermometer, at that frequency omega. So now this is why you would use that harmonic button on the lock-in that uh, uh, Matt Cowett was talking about and saying, well, you know, he came up with, uh, I think, some use of it. This would be another one where you want to look at 2 omega of the, uh, dry, the reference frequency. And, um, you also have to put some DC current because you want just the AC component. Why the AC component of this thermometer is, is a changing resistance. So you put a DC current, a few nanoamps, through that resistor and then measure its oscillation of the voltage across that resistor, giving you delta R. But it's a very small current, and you're picking up just very small changes then in the resistance. And you can pick up half percent, one percent changes in the resistance. The offset may be one percent. This might be one percent uh, temperature above your sample platform because of the offset in the power. But it's an AC technique, so you can use a lot of filtering to o and a lock-in amplifier to get rid of all the noise that's out of the frequency band of interest. No. <laughs> Millihertz. So yes, at megahertz, no, no luck. One of the problems, we don't run much megahertz here, because getting megahertz down into uh, a cryostat is difficult. 
Um, you can't use twisted pair. You have to run coax and you get reflections and you then pick up radio station. So in this case, your thermal time constant, if you can get this, and we've gotten it down to maybe 50 milliseconds. So we've run up to about 20 hertz, maybe a little higher. We've gone above 20 hertz, depending on the temperature range, because this thermal conductivity goes up as we go up in temperature, so we can go a little bit higher in frequency. But that's about the limit. But uh, we've gone down to about a tenth of a hertz, about 100 millihertz is about the lowest end. And that can take a long time for a lock-in to lock and, and respond. So that's the frequency range we usually work in there because of trying to design that, that uh, thermal link. Nothing happens fast at low temperatures. And your sample, I mean, even our samples that are 100 microns thick or something, you still have the thermal diffusion into the sample. So you can't really heat the whole sample at a megahertz frequency. Millihertz, yeah, it's millihertz is is more <laughs> more the f the thing we're on there. We're we're using the low end of those of all those lock-in amplifiers. So, in terms of parameters you actually measure, um, the T of the sample thermometer is going to be some temperature plus DC and this cosine theta plus some phase shift. <coughs> This depends on the power level, the frequency, and the heat capacity of the amplitude uh, to get the amplitude TAC and on the internal time constant of the material and the external uh, time constant to, the, to that sample holder. So this is really what determines the frequency you can use. The frequency has to be greater than that conduction time through the wire. If you go too slow, as soon as you start adding heat, it'll all conduct through the wires to the platform. The platform's regulated. It'll regulate your sample back to zero. So at some point, or it'll be basically a DC offset. So you'll lose signal if your frequency is too low and you, d and you can't really heat the sample above uh, equilibrium on that platform. There's also an internal time uh, period of the material itself. I talked about thermal diffusion, and you've got to be below that. You've got to actually heat the whole sample up or down, because if you've still got heat traveling through the material to the thermometer while you turn it off, you end up with a phase shift, and you also end up losing signal. So usually we do a frequency sweep, looking you know, from something low 1 hertz to 10 hertz. We look for 5 hertz, 8 hertz, wherever the sample tends to peak and not drop off. Um, and so your temperature response depends on the temperature, the actual value of the resistance of the thermometer, the sensitivity of the thermometer eta, and your AC voltage divided by this, the, the current you put through the sample thermometer that DC current. So your proportion, your, your, your voltage response, TAC, is proportional to the temperature response, which is inversely proportional to the heat capacity. So the one good thing is, is that the smaller your actual signal, the measurement, the larger your voltage response. So the smaller the heat capacity, the larger the, the thermal swings, the larger the uh, voltage response on the thermometer. So as your quantity gets smaller, it gets easier to measure. Of course, you have to then control the amount of power you put in because you're actually making it the temperature swings too big. So it doesn't really win as much as you'd like to think. As I said, we drive the frequency. We find the sweet spot. Phase shift, we start to see a phase shift in the, in the, between the uh, heater and the thermometer. It means that we're not uniformly heating the sample. You're heating half the sample, and then as the other half heats up, you've already turned off the heat, et cetera. Um, adjust the f we can adjust the frequency dynamically. So even as you're sweeping field and the thermal time constants, the heat capacity, the thermal diffusion time of the sample's changing, you can change the frequency on the fly. It's just 
as long as you record that frequency, you're fine because it comes out of the calculation. Um, samples less than a milligram, thin heaters and thermometers. And that whole little picture I showed you of that little capsule, it's self-contained. I can rotate it. So you can actually measure heat capacity as a function of angle because our, our uh, magnetic field's a vector. And I'll talk about a little why you'd want to do that and why it actually means something. So, um, and don't use copper. Your accuracy, yeah. As I said, getting absolute heat capacity out of the AC technique is rather difficult. Um, getting a proportional uh, heat capacity is fairly easy. Most of those time constants we do adjust and we make the addenda very, very small. As I said, by thinning those thermometers, we're adding less than a percent onto the heat capacity of the sample. It, of course, depends on the material and and really what the heat capacity is. But many of those heavy fermions have high heat capacities even at low temperature. And since we do a lot of that, um, that's where we are. Um, so. How much power can you Not that many. I mean, we're pretty confident you see a signal. If you see that signal at two omega, you're really measuring uh, the sample. Um, you can do, you do an empty cell to calibrate and figure out roughly what your addenda is. But if you see a signal that's much, that's below the, that, that you need more heat to get the same thermal response, that's your sample heating. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty clear that you've got a, a sample in there and, and have a response. Um, why no copper? Nobody. That's part of it. That's, that's, we like thermal conduction, some of the things, the platform itself. Adiabatic demagnetization. Copper's a refrigerant. Copper has a magnetic moment. So when you magnetize it, when you turn on your field, Entropy goes away, the heat comes out. When you turn off the field, the spins start to randomize. Entropy goes up, heat flows in, it cools your experiment. So you now your, your platform, which you want to be a nice uniform thing, is going up and down with the field, and it makes life easier, or it's much harder. Uh, it's, it's, it's just one extra thing, and so um, at low temperatures, you're gonna get this. So Stay as little copper as possible. Um, this is what we used. This is a silver platform. So we went to a silver and actually told them to machine this, this blue chunk, which is now our silver platform that we can regulate at a temperature out of aluminum, out, out of silver. Um, so this is, uh, has does not have the magnetic moment, does not have the demagnetization of copper. This is the weak link to the bath. This whole thing can sit in a dill fridge or in a helium-3 system in the liquid or a helium-4 system. And its link is right here at the end, and it just comes in. It's stainless. Um, we've used various things of stainless tubing with phosphor bronze wires impregnated in the middle. Uh, trying to get away from eddy currents, but even just a little bar stainless rod works pretty well for that. Um, up here, this green is usually, I need to I electrically isolate all my leads and stuff, but I want something that's a reasonably good conductor that'll be attached to this silver platform. I use a little sapphire uh, tube. So it's a little bit of sapphire tube here, kept fairly short. Um, and all the leads come through these little epoxy holes. This is all epoxy, epoxy. Um, and uh, this green here is an indium seal. So I can build this little thing, pop the top on it, 
use the purple nut here to compress the O-ring, make a little seal. I have a little vacuum cylinder. This whole thing can then go into my experiment. Um, the sapphire, these leads stick up. I can just attach them to the edges of my thermometers and heaters there. Ruthenium oxides in general, um, higher temperatures you can use Cernox, but you can't really thin down a Cernox. You can use some of the bare chip Cernox that uh, Lakeshore will sell, but we, we just bought a batch of ruthenium oxides and calibrate them ourselves because in grinding them down and soldering them into the cell, you end up changing the calibration, so you can't really use an externally commercially calibrated one. So then you have to put your own calibrated thermometer in the cell to calibrate these again. So um, we usually use nichrome heaters. Um, so you can also buy those on little chip resistors. You just have to make sure they're nichrome and not uh, cantalum sulfide or some weird things that sometimes chip makers make resistors out of and they do not work at low temperatures. But um, nichrome is really, really stable in both field and temperature. And so as a heater, it's great because you can count on it being basically whatever uh, resistance you pick. Um, there it is. Okay, so here's a little, here's an actual picture that that diagram showed. This just shows the, uh, that base with the leads coming through the epoxy feed through, the stainless post, silver platform. This one has all the twisted pair leads coming in, separating out for each individual lead through little holes in the silver and then some uh, die cast epoxy uh, holding them all in place. This is that little uh, sapphire tube and the sample sits right up above this on wires. And this whole thing hulking over the top uh, is actually the calibrated thermometer that I was going, that this run was calibrating the actual thermometers again. Um, the leads all come out the bottom, and then there's the nut here that compresses that, that O-ring. Now the nut compresses the O-ring. This does not screw in because you can't screw against uh, an indium O-ring, you'll just smear it and it'll never seal. You need to do an even compression to compress that little bit of indium around that sharp corner and into the edge there. And, okay. And uh, some more neat pictures. Um, the cell is all plastic to reduce any eddy current heating of the cell itself. But the advantage is, is you can see the indium O-ring compressed right here in the cell. All that heater and stuff is inside a little bit of capped on tubing and hidden away. This is actually a slightly different design than I showed you, but this, it, and it's smaller. Um, but this is the, uh, the indium making the seal. So you can sort of inspect your indium joint after you make it to make sure you did it. This is just laying down the, uh, we actually thin down the solder bumps on these things, uh, these little chip resistors. This is either one by two millimeters or half by one millimeters. We've used both. And soldering it to two phosphor bronze wires, uh, laying everything down. Here's the, uh, the heater, I believe, on one of these little chip carriers. And then this has built up the whole sample in that thing like you saw before. This is tightening the cell down. And this is, we're showing the, the, the sample grower that he grew too big a sample and we're gonna have to chop up his nice sample because our, our calorimeter is way too small. This whole calorimeter, as you can see, this is a five and a half millimeter wrench on the side. So this is a, actually a six millimeter diameter cylinder. So that one will fit in our dilution refrigerator in our 32 te uh, millimeter bore magnets and can rotate. There it is fitting in a rotator, sliding in. It'll be in the center, but that's just before it was inserted. Um, this is a picture from the side. 
This is our stack of those little chip carriers of the one with the heater. This is a spacer to hold the sample and the thermometer on the top. So we make the little stack. This is a silver platform with an embedded heater and thermometer in it to hold that as a regulated uh, uh, platform post, ba uh, not the bath, but the thermometer. This shows actually the backside of uh, one of the heaters, which has been thinned down, so you can actually see the pattern through the material if you backlight it. So, why rotate? Uh oh, I'm running out of time. So, uh oh, she stood up already on me. Okay, why rotate? Um, this was some data we took, heat capacity. As I said, it's an ARBS at the moment because getting absolute numbers is really uh, tough. But this is changing the angle from zero to two degrees away from the field being on a layered material uh, between the planes of the material and just a two degree shift. Now you can't mount a sample by eye better than five degrees and most people about 10 degrees, but five degrees is about the best you can do. So you can be guaranteed when you put a sample in, no matter how well you do that, it's gonna be off by about five degrees. For most measurements, that doesn't matter. For this material, it matters a huge amount. You start to get a first order phase transition, and which is barely there at 0.6 degrees and is completely gone by the time you're one degree off from being parallel to the plane. So in here is a nice hysteretic tr phase transition. Um, you want to align it, so you need to rotate. Uh, um, bonus. <laughs> I'm going to skip that because somebody is standing up and everybody wants lunch. Magnetocaloric effect. As you sweep, and this is go if you look at the thermodynamics and the Maxwell relations and all this, the bottom line here is that the temperature of the of the sample will be depends on the change in magnetization with temperature, the MDT times the HDT, the ramp rate of your magnet. So you get constant heat coming out of the sample as the magnetization changes, which keeps the sample at an elevated temperature, depending on your thermal length to the bath, because if you had a good thermal length, um, it, you wouldn't get a delta T, but since it's a weak thermal length, the sample heats up a little and stays above. Or if the MDT is positive, it stays a little bit below. So you'll get heating or cooling of the sample just by measuring delta T. As you ramp the magnet, you can get a magnetization out of the material. Um, in this case, we've ramped up as red, down as blue. You can see we get a huge heat pulse coming out and a small heat pulse on the down. There's, uh, you can get this from latent heats and because you end up with a little bit of super cooling. The transition was about here probably. We got a little bit below the transition. The sample was in a little metastable state. As it dropped down to ground state, it gave a little heat pulse here. So you ended up with heat pulses, both heating and cooling in that case. This one had very little uh, hysteresis and you end up with a cooling pulse on the upsweep and a uh, heating pulse on the downsweep showing a nice uh, transition uh, with the, uh, the heat coming out, uh, probably a, oh, it could be first or second order. That one's hard to tell at the moment. So you get the mega Klein. Uh, pesky thermometry. Um, you remember that formula? I, let, I didn't really say much about eta, the sensitivity of the thermometer. Um, we need R, we need eta as a function of temperature. Uh, so we have to calibrate all our, our thermometry in field. There is no in field independent standard that's really good. We can use vapor pressure helium over a finite range. We can use vapor pressure helium three, but even that has some problems as, as some of your students will tell you of, of trying to measure and actually get absolute temperature to high accuracy, independent of field and limited range. Um, melting curve thermometry is another way, but that's got its own large thing. So what we do, 
is we uh, use cooling power of the fridges. And so we heat and cool the fridge at zero field. We heat and cool, we heat, we basically do a heat sweep uh, power input at field, and we assume the cooling power of the system is identical. Now, most of that cooling power is through the weak link. Um, it doesn't change with field, as far as we know, because we picked stainless steel or something that doesn't have a field dependence to its temperature, uh, the thermal conductivity. And we can then fit resistance versus temperature. Um, I fit with Chebyshev polynomials because they're orthogonal. You can know when you've got a good fit because the coefficients all go down and alternate in sign. Um, and when you've got too many of them, they start getting noisy and random. So you can stop. Uh, the sensitivity comes right out of the, that eta of the same fit parameters. And you, for each of these fits, then at different fields, this happened to be a 10 Tesla fit of a sixth order Chebyshev. I can then look at the Chebyshev and fit those as a function of field. So now I've got Chebyshev coefficients that are a function of field that give me resistance as a function of temperature, and I can get eta out of that. Um, this is just an example of several fields where I can fit the Chebyshev uh, as a function of B, which was the Chebyshev at B equals zero, times two ratios of uh, uh, power laws. So these two ratios uh, is a Pade approximate. They're very good at capturing stuff that has sharp changes in one area and very little change in others, because it turns out these coefficients can change rapidly at low field and then gradually all the way on up to 30, 40 Tesla. And I'm going to finish this up and make, oh, Renee's also left, so. And I just wanted to say one last thing uh, about another technique that we don't use here, but this is very useful in some cases. Um, if you have a thermometer, an ordinary thermometer, uh, one of these resistance thermometers, and you drive it at omega, it, hel it heats itself. And if you drive it too much current through the thermometer, it heats and changes its own resistance. That's usually bad because you're not really ohmic anymore. You don't have a good thermometer. But in this case, it works. So what happens is, is that you end up heating and cooling at 2 omega. So your thermometer itself is now your AC calorimeter. If you put a, and mixing that with omega, you get a response at omega, and you get a response at 3 omega. If you look at 3 omega, this is really the component you want, because this shows how much self-heating and cooling of the thermometer you're getting of mixing the heating at 2 omega and the thermometer excitation at omega. If you slap a thin film on top of that thermometer, you can then change how much of that self-heating, because it'll be less because you've added extra heat capacity, if you can couple it right to the film itself. So by overdriving your thermometer, you can, and having a very tightly coupled thin film on top of it, even, or even a thick film, but you may not, you can run this at fairly high frequency then, where your heat diffusion may not be complete into the material, but at least gives you some heat capacity within a boundary layer of the material. And so you can get an idea of the heat capacity of things that are very tough to measure using other techniques. So that's really one extra technique. As I said, it hasn't been used here a lot, but it is a rather clever way to get heat capacity. This could be used, uh, say, inside a pressure cell. If you can get something really tightly coupled, it, it's hopefully the medium of the pressure cell is far enough away that you're not coupling to it, that you're coupled mainly to your sample. Getting an absolute number is going to be really tough with this, but you can see changes, and that's what we're about here, a lot of what we do here is where is the changes, where has the stuff undergone a phase transition? So I think that's, yep, that's end of show, it says. So that's the end of my show. <laughs>
question. Yes. It's not necessarily. Because the thermometers are on that alumina substrate, so if I put it so the alumina is down, I can use silver paint and do a good one. Um, some cases, the samples aren't compatible. The silver paint will make them fall apart, and we use something else. But you know, it's some of the weird organic materials don't like silver paint, <laughs> so they'll just dissolve away. Um, so it depends on the sample compatibility. But silver paint's a good one. Um, it's got a nice low heat conductivity, but it fills in very nicely, so it makes a fairly uniform coupling. Again, you use as little as possible. Really? Yes. There's about maybe two tenths of a percent dip. I don't know what the magneto resistance. I've never measured any magneto resistance on them at all, up to 45 tesla. Um, there is about a half, a 0.2 percent dip in their resistance around liquid nitrogen temperatures. So if you cool down from very carefully, I mean, you know, we're talking two ohms out of a thousand ohm resistor. Um, you can maybe see a little bit around liquid nitrogen, but it's, it's actually very hard to measure their changes. Um, again, almost because you have lead resistance and everything else, we drive these things um, with uh, current source and you then um, measure the voltage. So you actually get a four wire measurement. So even if it changes a little, um, you've got uh, a measurement of the actual heater resistance and power going through it. We measure it anyway, but it's almost always been constant and stuff. And so when we lose some leads, which always happens, those are the ones we give up and say, we're going to assume it's constant. So when a lead breaks, that's the one lead we, we, we don't care quite so much about. Other questions?